Thanks, Bruce. You might like to leave your Bibles open at Luke chapter 1. Let's pray. Father, as we come and look at your word uh, and look at this topic of hope, uh, we ask that you would speak to us and fill us with a, with a joy and a sense of peace uh, through what you have done for us in Christ. Help us to focus on your word now. Amen. Well, there's a website out there and it's called Life Hack, and, it's, and one of its pages starts this way. We may easily lose hope for our world and have even wept for humanity because of the bad news we hear every day of the unfairness we encounter. We may feel disappointed and want to be indifferent to what is happening around us. Then the page goes on uh, and it shows some pictures uh, to restore our faith in humanity. And you'll see the first one up there on the screen and it's, uh, it's got a school teacher. Uh, there he is there, let, let me read the caption. So one of the students came with her kid because she did not have a babysitter. The kid starts to cry in the middle of the class. So his mum, all embarrassed, gets up to leave and the professor took the kid from her calmed him and continued teaching. The next one is a dog in a wheelchair. This guy has a dog and she can't walk anymore. So he takes her out for a walk every day in a wheelchair. I couldn't find any words for this. Parking meter. You ran out of time, I fixed that issue. Now, that'd be nice to come back to, wouldn't it? And the last one is um, uh, a, a homeless man. He found $2,400 on the street and he turned it in to the police. His honesty led people to start a fundraising campaign on his behalf, which ended up raising more than $5,000, which he refused, insisting that the money should be given to others and that all he really wanted was a job. See, there are people in the world who do good things. And like you, I'm, I was touched by these stories. They're nice to see, aren't they? Perhaps there is a hope for the future after all. Perhaps everyone will eventually learn to get along and be kind to each other. At Christmas time, we renew the story of hope. We like to hear a message of hope. Uh, I did a, a search of Christmas cards and found quite a few that were out there circulating around in the community that mentioned the word hope. Uh, of the cards I saw, not one tied hope back to the North Pole and Santa Claus. Uh, a typical secular card has words like this, wishing peace, hope and love for the world. Merry Christmas and best wishes for a happy holiday season. But many cards, even in some sort of vague way, wanted to bundle together the Christmas story with human hope. See, hope needs an anchor. People need certainty and they need stability. We need a reason for living. Uh, in fact, the first century Roman author, uh, Pliny the Elder, going back a while, he wrote this back in the first century. Hope is the pillar that holds up the world. Hope is the dream of a waking man. Well, for the atheist, hope rests on an increasing uh, awareness and an improvement of human ingenuity. For the capitalist, hope rests on acquiring wealth and possessions. And good for you if you're an atheist with lots of money, I guess. For the religious person, there is no shortage of world religions. Someone has done a count, and there's about 4,300 world religions out there from which to choose. But for the typical Australian, hope flows from none of these religions because we have perfected the she'll be right, mate, religion. Which is the hope? Which hope is the pillar that holds up the world? Well, when life is sweet, hope is far from our minds as we enjoy the pleasures of the moment. But life is rarely always sweet. 
financial ruin, uh, relationship breakdown, accidents, sickness, pain and death. On Four Corners last Monday, uh, I watched uh, a program written about the tragedy of the White Island uh, incidents in New Zealand. There were 47 people on the island when it suddenly erupted on the 9th of December last year. Uh, no one went on that tour expecting to die, but 19 people lost their lives. Which hope is the pillar that holds up the world? The secular mind believes that the only way of acquiring truth is through scientific inquiry. Any appeal to faith shatters the possibility of rational assessment. Therefore, we cannot rely on Luke the historian because his faith is not the product of his inquiry, but it is what shapes his inquiry. Of course, the skeptic says, a Christian will always write a record of Jesus which affirms his point of view. Rather, the critic argues, faith must be withheld until sufficient evidence enables the inquirer to see clearly. But there's another path of inquiry we can take. Along with Augustine, we can say, I believe in order to understand. Faith, rather than hindering the truth about Jesus, is a legitimate way of acquiring truth about Jesus. Faith leads us to a place of knowledge. When we place our faith in historical, credible, factual documents, and when we read them for the purpose of listening to the word of God, we are led into truth. The world may tell us otherwise, but it does so from the point of view of its own assumptions about life and death. Which hope is the pillar that holds up the world? It's the hope acquired by faith in Jesus, which is grounded in God's historical activity among men and women. Or we can put it this way, as Eugene uh, Peterson does, and you'll see it there on the screen. In a world filled with conflict and suffering, people often lose all hope. The coming of Jesus into this world offers us a clear and real hope that everything wrong in the world will be made right again in the end. And by following Jesus, we can offer hope to others, not only for life today, but also for the eternal life to come. So for the rest of our time, let's consider the two points, two of those points arising from Peterson's quote. First, the coming of Jesus into this world offers us clear and real hope. And second, we can offer the hope of the gospel to others. The coming of Jesus into this world offers us clear and real hope. We see this in Luke 1, and I hope you're there uh, in your Bibles. The word hope, though, you may have mentioned, uh, you may have noticed, rather, is not mentioned at all in the chapter. The word hope is not there, but the good news, um, but, but of course, hope is there, isn't it? The good news that the angel speaks about in verse 19 is the news of hope. For hundreds of years, God had been silent and hope was fading away. But now the angel appears and declares, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news, this good news, this great news, the news that you needed to hear. Oh, both Zechariah and Elizabeth, we know, were unable to have children despite praying for many years that God will give them a family. And now in those older years, they're in their older years now, these prayers have grown faint, for Elizabeth is beyond her years. But the angel renews their hope. Verse 12, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. But Zechariah doesn't believe the angel. Instead of hope, there is unbelief and the Lord silences him because no one will silence the message of hope. And when the angel of family planning appears to, man, to Mary, the angel comes with a message of hope. You will conceive and give birth to a son 
and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. A hope grounded in Old Testament expectation. Now, if I were to ask you, what Old Testament passages come to your mind? When you think of the Christmas story, when you think of the birth of Jesus, how many do you think you can think of? My parents used to leave a glass of laminated fruitcake out for Santa the night before Christmas. This stirred up hope and excitement amongst us kids. And when the angel drops hints of Old Testament hope, it creates an exciting sense of expectation. Now, I, I trust in, that I'm not being overly cynical. You know me, I'm not cynical. We find it hard to share in this Old Testament um, hope, this Old Testament joy of expectation. Since the Old Testament is not part of our national heritage, we are, after all, Gentiles. And since we live after the birth of Jesus, and since we know the rest of the story, it's tempting for us to become detached from the Christmas story and perhaps uh, those Old Testament um, um, anticipation of Jesus coming. We just like to leave it there. It doesn't stir us up. We are not supposed to duplicate the raw emotions of that first Christmas as though we are actors in the original story. What Zechariah felt what Elizabeth felt, what Joseph felt, what Mary felt. These feelings belong to them and not to us. We live centuries later and in a culture so different from first century Rome. We have a long history of Christian church behind us and Christological battles have been fought and won and the theological understanding of the church has matured over time. Yeah, we are in a privileged position. We are in a disadvantaged position because the philosophical mood of our day tries to persuade us to abandon the hope stored up for us in heaven. We are some of the richest people on the planet. Right now we are. If Israel had built a luxury uh, uh, resort in the wilderness, how eager would they have been to get to the promised land? So how then should we receive Luke's account of the Christmas story? Well, Luke tells us um, back in the, uh, in the first few verses of his gospel. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. We rehearse the events of Christmas because we need to be reminded that the gospel is true. We need to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus with our head, with our heart, with our actions. Luke has done his, his homework and like Theophilus, we need to be reminded of the reliability, uh, the truth of the things that we have been taught. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So listen to samples from the Old Testament. Psalm 45, 6, you'll see it there. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. See, the psalm was originally a wedding song and a royal one of that. The psalm celebrated the wedding of a king to a princess. In its original setting, Psalm 46 makes no reference to a future divine king. And yet as the Old Testament unfolds and by the time of Mary, we see a depth in these verses previously unseen. The promise of a king whose rule will last forever and ever. His kingdom will never end. Imagine saying that to a prime minister. Your rule will never end. I wouldn't believe you. would. Jesus, his kingdom will never end. Then there's Isaiah 9, 6-7. For us, 
A child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And uh, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. See, traditional Judaism interpreted these words as applying to Hezekiah, king of Judah, a later king. But the New Testament gets its idea of an eternal rule of peace from the promises of an eternal line of kings throughout the Old Testament. The Messiah will rule forever. Nothing will overcome Jesus or bring a halt to his reign of peace. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 records Daniel's vision of the Son of Man. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never end ever, never be destroyed. In the Gospels, whenever Jesus exercises his authority, he does so as the Son of Man who has given authority, glory and sovereign power over all the peoples of the earth. This small child will have his authority rejected by men which will take him to the cross, but he will rise to exercise authority over all things and he will come again to establish his eternal rule. And so the coming of Jesus into this world offers us clear and a real hope. He will rescue his people from the hands of his enemies. He will establish his eternal rule of peace. Stand alongside Theophilus and know with certainty the things that you have been taught. And then we can offer the, the hope of the gospel to others. Eugene Peterson uh, again says in his little book, The Message of Christmas, in a world filled with conflict and suffering, people often lose all hope. The coming of Jesus into this world offers us a clear and real hope that everything wrong in the world will be made right again in the end. And by following Jesus, we can offer hope to others, not only for life today, but also for the eternal life to come. The message we have for a world, for this world, is that God became flesh and he hung in my place, bearing the penalty for my sin, and he rose from the dead, and soon with confidence I know that I will rise to be with him. God will repair this world, and all things will exist forever under Christ as head. Uh, Paul says in Colossians, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, the Christmas story here in Luke begins particularly as a Jewish story. Christ was born into the nation of Israel. Jesus grew up in a Jewish home. He was presented to the Lord in the temple, a, a Jewish temple. And Simeon, a Jew, took Jesus in his arms and said, Sovereign Lord, and this is in Luke 2, 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. See, Simeon hints here that the gospel will be for the hoi polloi. I love those words, the hoi polloi. They just sound so Greek. And See, that hoi polloi means the others, the rest, everybody else who isn't a Jew, for the rest of the world, right? the Gentiles. Uh, Simeon is hinting that the gospel will go out to everybody. Israel was called to be God's servant to the nations. 
In Acts 10, Peter meets Cornelius the centurion, the Gentile centurion. And Peter wants none of it because he believes that the gospel is just there and it's available for Jewish people. But the spirit moves swiftly and Peter is left to conclude, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. The gospel is a message to be shared among the nations. Luke shares with us the time when Jesus went into the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah. The Lord stood up and said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. This Christmas, there are lots of poor people out there. People in prison uh, by family violence, dysfunctional families, sickness, depression, drugs, mental health issues, the aftermath of drought, fires and COVID-19 have altered the course of many lives. There are people blinded by the hopelessly contradictory messages of this age, which rob people of identity, purpose and self-esteem. The radical revision of identity politics and the undoing of sexuality. How can we at St Stephen's remain silent? An Alaskan biologist was perhaps the only man to ever investigate the bear's reputation for attacking humans. When Fleming encountered a bear, he neither ran away nor shot it with his gun. He did neither of those things. And at the end of his unique study, Fleming had encountered 81 brown bears, and although several had mocked charges towards him, not one actually attacked. It takes courage to be a follower of Jesus. I meet people who have never been to church. They don't know a Christian. What they know about religion comes from social media and television. There's a huge gap between the churched and the unchurched. I meet people who have been so damaged by church that they cannot even face, turn their face toward a church door ever again. I meet people who talk like a Christian, walk like a Christian, act like a Christian, and one day they rise and leave, never to be seen again. But we press on. For we are convinced that the birth of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, is the greatest story of all. A story that started with Abraham, the solution was anticipated for thousands of years and now we know that all the promises of God find their amen in Jesus. Thank God that we have an inheritance that will never spoil, perish or fade and it's a hope to be shared in Tamworth to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that what you have given to us in Christ, this hope, is one that can never be stolen from us. Father, we, we come to a gospel like Luke and we know that we need to be reminded of the certainty of the things that we have been taught, that we need to be reminded that the hope that we have in Christ is a real and living hope and no one can snatch it out of our hands. But Father, it's also a hope to be shared. It's also a hope to be spoken about and articulated and engaged with for this word of yours is a living word, uh, as sharp as a two-edged sword that penetrates the hearts and lives of people. And Father, why, while we may feel a disconnect with the world around us, we know that your spirit working can make connections and father help us to be able to therefore express our faith in meaningful ways 
Father, help our church to be uh, a living witness in, in unity and in action and in witness. And Father, we ask that you would use us uh, to your glory and for your purposes. Amen.